Well, hello. Welcome back to A Book Thoughts. This one is a little different. I'm not actually going to be talking about a specific book, but just something about the way I read books that I wanted to talk about. So, if you don't know me, you might not know, history is my first great love. That was one of the things I studied in, in college. Um, if I, It would not surprise me if I went back to grad school for it someday in the future when I didn't have to care about history, PhDs not actually making you money. Maybe one day, who knows. But I love history. And I learn, you learn some things in history about how to read, right? Now, part of that is to get through, you know, four or 500 pages in a week and extract meaning or how to read primary sources and arrange them into arguments. That's all well and good. But that's not what this is about. Historians read fiction of the eras that we study. Now, why do we do that? We do it for a very specific reason. It isn't for the detail, although that can be helpful sometimes. Um, if you know you read, if you're reading, uh, say, *The Golden Ass*, which is a novel-ish from uh, from Roman times. You know, you could you can pick up some detail about like how different things are kind of you know set up in society, but really that's kind of dangerous because if you read modern things, how often is it that you have something set in a in a modern society that the details aren't really uh, an accurate depiction of reality? We'll say. Think about all the cop shows. You really hope your lawyer hasn't learned all their law from cop shows because it's not that connected to reality. However, fiction can be very useful for finding out about the author. Now, the author was a real person living in the real world. In the act of writing, they have crafted a world based on their own understanding of what's happening around them. They're willing to change details, given the needs of their stories, but fundamentally within them, how they understand how the world works, how people work, how government works, the role of religion in society, all of these things are built in really deep to how they think. I mean, makes sense, right? They. Those are some fundamental types of things about your outlook of the world. Very few people will throw that to the side, or even can throw that to the side, whenever they approach any kind of project, much less a creative writing project where you're trying to strike some level of authenticity. There's nothing more authentic than what's at that base level for you. So, so that's, that's what... We, a major thing for reading history. If you read um, The Germinal, which is a French novel by Emile Zola about coal mining in, in uh, 1800s France, he spent a lot of time getting the details very right. And you can learn stuff from that. But you can also learn how Zola understood the role of capital and labor, how he understood the, the, what he thought the plight of the uh, underprivileged classes were, um, what he thought of rabble-rousers and, and strikes and unions. And, and in that, you, you find his understanding, his personal understanding of what right and wrong was, the place of government, how an economy should work. It was all built in there in order to have the things that you can see on the surface. He had to have an understanding and a framework. And then in that, you know, you get a, a very good look, a very intimate look, as it were, of someone in the era and how they understood the world around them. Incredibly useful. Incredibly useful. Now, I normally talk about fiction on these, and I've actually here to talk about fiction again. I learned how to read fiction that way for studying history. 
And it's not something that I can just turn off. And it's not something I would like to turn off, because I find it very useful in my own pleasure reading. Okay. Okay. So why would I bring that to my pleasure reading? What would that get me? I'm not looking to understand the author, necessarily, whenever I'm just reading a work of fantasy or science fiction, you know. I just want, I want the story, you know. I'm not reading Game of Thrones, The Song of Ice and Fire, to learn about what George R. R. Martin thinks about the modern world or how people work. I'm reading it to be engaged and, you know, to be transported by the narrative, to maybe find the themes and see if they resonate with me, uh, depending on if I'm reading, you know, some some popcorn, you know, some popcorn level fiction or something a little more high minded. I still might, you know, be looking for the themes, um, what the meaning of the story is, those kinds of things. But uh, I'm really not necessarily trying to piece together the author. I, ideally, you kind of forget the author's there. But So why wouldn't I want to forget this? Now, the author, I read a lot of science fiction and fantasy. Um, and I also read some historical fiction, too. The author is, once again, building these worlds based on their understanding of how people work, of how governments work, about how economics and the military and crime and motivation. These are things that they didn't just come up with on the spot to build the story. So as I'm reading a book, if I'm reading a new book, you know, one off or a new series, I'm always asking myself, what are the author's um, implicit biases, implicit logical structures upon which they're building their world building. Now, if I can find those, I can, on my end, end up filling in a lot of gaps in world building because I understand the continuity. I understand, you know, a hole isn't just a hole for me. I understand what should kind of go there. Um, I, and not only that, it makes it tends to make world building a lot more cohesive because they're taking a single thread and applying that across no matter how many societies, no matter how many series they write, no matter any of that, you will see um, it work the same way, generally speaking. Uh, a, a good example of this is, and that's fairly easy to see, is what an author thinks about redemption, right? If they write a lot of redemption arcs, well, you can come to expect redemption arcs, and it means something to them. It means something to you when you see a character who could or could not be redeemed. You, you can understand that within this world, within this author's worldview, redemption is a, a fool thing, all is forgiven. Redemption is you have to earn it. Redemption is... You know, you might you have to sacrifice something to earn your redemption, or redemption might not be possible. You know, um, people are people, a leopard can't change its spots. Any of those is a potential worldview that you will see woven into an author's works. Uh, so it really helps with, with the world building, and like I just mentioned, how a, uh, a and understanding how a narrative is going to be structured. I tend to make decent guesses at where a story is going because I spend a lot of time thinking about how the narrate or how the author believes the characters would react to situations. If the author, um, you know, if, if the author believes that, to give a really simplified example, if, if an author believes that violence is never justified um, you're probably not going to see hero, hero characters solve a problem through violence. You know, and then you're gonna, not going to expect that in any story. Now, you can take that and apply it to something much more narrowly defined. And we can... we can. I have an example that we're going to get to in a minute here. Um, yeah, so those are the three... So being able to understand the world building being able to better immerse yourself and 
being able to kind of um, like slot into the narrative better are three major advantages that I find to approaching all of my reading like this. And I want to give a couple examples. One is that I've read the first two books of the Honor Harrington series. Now, there is a very clear worldview in this series because we have a lot of politics happening. We have a lot of political factions with their own solutions towards problems. All right. So, you know, in the second book, there is a character who basically argues the, I hope now, more defunct um, theory that you can basically shape another country's foreign policy and their relations entirely through economics, right? Now, that's kind of out of place with a story where the main character is a warrior and, you know, a ship's captain. So you you have that tension there, which is obvious, like, good writing to have tension between, you know, characters that are on the same side, but, you know, are butting heads. So that's good writing. But in this, we can also see, because we've saw in the first book and now in this book, that, you know, Honor was never bringing military action as a first resort. It was always a last resort, but it was always a final decisive thing um and that's that's important because now i know going in forward i understand how uh david weber writes or believes the interrelation between politics diplomacy foreign affairs and military might and military action i understand how he has those layered together so now as we go forward and there's a a continued long-running tension between the Kingdom of Manticore and the Haven People's Republic, I can understand how the actors understand their own actions. And that's going to help me get a lot closer to the characters. It's going to help me make sh feel that the actions that they take are within character, you know. Um, and I'm also going to help, it's also going to help me figure out what I, you know, my guess is as to where the story's going next. Another good example is the Witcher series. Andrzej Sapkowski, sorry if I'm pronouncing that name wrong, has a, has very clear feelings about the basic misanthropy of man, basically, uh, of, of humanity, and, but also the bright spots within us. You know, um, the whole notion of that series is that Geralt is a monster hunter and in that mutated and supposedly a monster himself. He's supposed to not have emotions, not feel, um, have the good driven out of him. But we often see that it's the peop the good people who often have the good driven out of them. And it's Geralt who has a strong moral compass that, and a strong ethical compass that he's engaged with the entire time. And we find characters from all walks of life who either have a moral and ethical stand or develop one over time, and but they're the minority. And they affect those around them. This is an understanding of the world that is very Eastern European, to be <laughs> totally honest, but um, is is so vital so you have to understand that's how Andrej has constructed his world and without it without understanding that on our end on the reader's end it's a depressing place it's it's just everything is you know crap but if you look at it from his end it's a very hopeful place maybe hopeful isn't the right word but it isn't full of despair it's it's not something to despair over because we do have the moral people, the ethical people fighting, 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 fighting. They don't win every battle. They don't win even necessarily the majority of their battles, but they are making a difference. And 
if you didn't take the time to understand Sapkowski, I'm not sure that you would walk away from that book understanding Geralt. Because Geralt doesn't exist. He's an extension of Sapkowski. So, you know, it, we had one example on the very macro level. This example is on the very micro level. Um, every one of, of the characters in that book, of our hero characters, is very different from one another. You know, whether you're talking about Geralt or Yen or Siri or Yasker Dan Dilein, depending on, you know, what translation and whatnot you're going with, they all have very different views of the world, right? Geralt wants to look out for his, you know, for him and his, and he wants to mostly be left alone. Dandelion's always on a grand crusade, somewhat selfish, and getting into trouble. Yennefer's a power player. She's she's willing to make sacrifices. She's willing to risk others um, for her sometimes selfish, sometimes pragmatic goals. Uh, these are, you know, and, and Ciri is growing up with all of these people and being influenced by them and finding who she is all of these but all of these characters as distinct as they are come from one man sapkowski so if we can understand sapkowski we're way ahead on understanding all of these characters so um and how they view the, the world they live in how they interact with things and it's just i think very it completes uh, my understanding of what I read. Uh, so that's all I really wanted to say about this. Um, I'm willing to expound more, expand on any points that anyone, you know, um, is confused by or wants to engage with or just wants me to expand on. You know, maybe examples of other things I've read and, and how I've, what I understand about the authors from having read it, like, is an example. But, I think that it is, uh, hmm. but that's all I really have for right now. I think this video is going to end up a little bit on the shorter side, which, you know, isn't a bad thing. Um, I have a, an answer planned for next Wednesday-ish, uh, you know, depending on how busy I get. And that's all I have for the moment. Uh, feel free to submit more questions ask for, I don't know, updates on anything else I'm doing, I, you know, whatever. Drop me a comment, like, subscribe, whatever, and I will talk to you guys later. All right, goodbye.